Okay, hey everyone. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us. Um, this is a just an inclusive cannabis policy forum that you're uh, participating in tonight, just so you know you're in the right place, I hope. Um, this webinar is being recorded, just so everyone knows. Um, it's actively being recorded now, and I will be sharing a link out to the recording, um, both publicly through our list, so folks can watch later, and also to all of you who are attending here. Um, just for a little run of show, so everybody knows what to expect, we're going to start out, um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Maddie Kempner, and I am the policy director at NOFA Vermont. It's the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. Uh, we are a statewide organization um, whose mission is to build an economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just food system in Vermont for the benefit of all living things. Um, we do a lot of different work in the food system. Many of you may be familiar with us. Uh, we have a farmer services team that provides excellent technical assistance. Shout out to Bill Cavanaugh. I see you in the attendee list. Um, we have a certification program that's accredited by the USDA to do organic certification um, on farms and processing businesses in Vermont called Vermont Organic Farmers. Um, and we do lots of work around community food access and farm to school and farm institution. And we also do policy and advocacy work um, to support the food system that we want to build. And that is my role. Um, and I will be your facilitator here this evening. And um, so you know what to expect. We're gonna start with a round of introductions of all of our fabulous panelists here. And then we'll move into a discussion section. Um, we have some questions for, for the panelists queued up. Uh, and then we will close with an open Q&A and we invite um, everyone who is attending to pop any questions um, that you may have into the chat box. And when we get to our Q&A and discussion uh, section, we'll get around to that and I'll pull those questions from the chat. Um, so if you have questions as we're going, just put them in the chat and we will get to them um, at the end. So now I'm gonna start off with our panel intros and I'm gonna go based on who I can see on my screen first. Um, so Jeffrey, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you, Maddie. Um, thank you everyone for taking uh, Busy moments out of the year, out of the season. I know for our farmers who have joined us and our cultivators, thank you guys. Um, my name is Jeffrey Pizzatello. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Vermont Growers Association. So we are uh, the, probably the new kids in the block uh, looking at this uh, lineup of fantastic organizations before us, but we are Vermont's uh, Cannabis Trade Association. So we represent the interests of um, small farmers, small businesses, more than just growers, uh, all uh, corners of the emerging cannabis industry. Um, and uh, I look forward to this conversation. Um, and uh, this is very exciting. I'm uh, humbled and appreciative of um, our coalition that we recently formed. Uh, and I look forward to uh, having a discussion with everyone. Uh, thank you. Aha. Okay, I will, uh, Elisa, Elisa, excuse me, you're up next. Hi, my name is Elisa Cassidy. Um, I am a cannabis grower who I started about uh, 12 years ago in 2008, uh, growing THC on the East Coast. Then I moved to California um, to work for five seasons uh, in Northern California for full-term outdoor cultivation. Um, also doing some greenhouse cultivation and furthering indoor my indoor uh, where I sold some of it to dispensaries in California. Um, I then moved to Oregon right out of right outside of Portland um, and worked in a whole a wholesale uh, facility indoor facility for THC flower um, and learned the value of efficiency and uh, moving volume. Um, then I moved on 2019 to Vermont, right outside of Middlebury, as a manager of a 15-acre CBD farm, uh, focusing on smokable flour and biomass. Um, so, yeah, I've just been working um, in cannabis and in plants, and I'm an advocate, and I've been consulting around a little bit, um, just getting my hands dirty. So it's really awesome to be here. Thank you for including me. Thank you so much for being here, Elisa. It's really great to have you. Um, and next we'll go to Jesse. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jesse Lucas. I'm one of the owners of GMG Farms. We are a small organic farm located in Charlotte, Vermont. 
Um, we established ourselves um, in 2019 and we have been cultivating cannabis, specifically high CBD cannabis, also for smokable flour. And um, we are a business that also is trying to sort of find our way um, sort of through a lot of um, adversities, I guess, in this whole entire industry. And we'd like to share our voice and just experiences um, as what we've gone through. And um, I'm also very humbled to be here today and asked to speak. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for being here, Jesse. Um, Bram, you're up next. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to those in the audience for joining us tonight. My name is Graham Eunanks Rufinacht. I am the policy director at Rural Vermont, which is a, an agricultural advocacy organization. We work through advocacy, education, and organizing to achieve equity and justice in the, in the local and regional food system. Um, I'm also a small farmer. I raise grass-fed beef cattle here in the Callis Marshfield area, um, do some uh, research into perennial vegetables, and provide some agricultural services, such as pruning and uh, garden consultation work as well. Um, I don't think I have any more to offer. I'll pass it along. Thanks, Graham. I think you have much more to offer, and we'll get to that in a little while. Um, Mark, introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I am Mark Hughes. Uh, I am an Iowa native. I've been in Vermont now for about 11 years, and I'm a recovering cybersecurity analyst, and I, I picked up uh, racial justice advocacy in 2014 after the death of Michael Brown. I started an organization uh, called uh, Justice for All. Justice for All's mission is to mis uh, dismantle systemic racism, uh, eliminate poverty, uh, and ensure racial equity through advocacy, uh, education, and relationship building. Uh, we were able to, uh, over the years, develop a policy arm called the Racial uh, Justice Alliance, which is really involved in a lot of other things across the state to include um, statewide policy. Uh, which kind of uh, brought us on to S54, um, also some land use policy and amongst other things to include a constitutional amendment to um, clarify uh, slavery even in our constitution here in Vermont. The Racial Justice Alliance's mission is to um, advocate for the implementation for state and local policy uh, with our collective strength, voice and, and leadership. I'm glad uh, to be with you today and I'm glad to see that so many of you have joined. Look forward to the conversation. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, thanks for being here and I'm excited to dig into this a little bit. Um, I, I should have set up a poll and I am now, sorry I didn't do that because I wanna know, um, I wanna know who's in the audience. I think we could do this using, um, using the raise hands function. Can folks see that? Yes, okay, people can raise their hands. All right, um, raise your hand. Now you're gonna have to take them down so you can put them back up. Uh, raise your hand if you are somebody who is a, an active um, participant or business or member of the cannabis industry. Okay, a few of y'all, awesome. Ooh, I expect some good questions in this Q&A later. Um, raise your hand if you are a policy advocate. Uh, anybody from like academia? Oh, folks. Uh, is there anybody from the NOFA Vermont Farmer Services team here? <laughs> Bill Cavanaugh. No fishman's got his hand up. That's false. Um, all right. What else? Anybody else want to throw um, who, what group or, uh, or industry you represent in the chat if I missed you? We have a legislator, fabulous. We're our target audience, um, an attorney, excellent, welcome. All right, well, as everybody else puts their, uh, their input into the chat, I will get us kicked off in this discussion. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about um, the policy, the existing proposed policy um, that will create a tax and regulate market in the state um, which is S54, uh, and just so that everyone is kind of on the same page with that and its status. 
Uh, it has passed, 54 has passed both the House and Senate, and it is now in a conference committee uh, made up of three members of each chamber of the legislature. Uh, and that conference committee started meeting again last week after, um, after a recess and obviously a very unusual and COVID-19 focused legislative session this year. Uh, and so um, we will be digging in a little bit to that policy, um, what we would like to see in a just and inclusive policy um, as folks, you know, representing growers and industry professionals and uh, racial justice advocates. And in that spirit, I will kick us off into discussion. Um, and again, I'll remind everybody, if you have questions that come up while we're discussing, we are going to be opening it up to Q&A um, at the end of the session. So if you have questions that come up, you can put them in the chat um, and we will do that Q&A session toward the end. Uh, so this first question is for Mark, uh, but folks can weigh in on this. Panelists can weigh in um, afterwards if you, have, if you have thoughts to add. Um, why is the current separate expungement bill that's going through the legislature, S-294, uh, not adequate to address racial and reparative justice concerns? And what this is kind of a two or three part question. Um, what steps does S-54 currently take to address equity for communities most harmed by the war on drugs um, and cannabis prohibition? And what steps do you want to see? Wow, I thought we were going to make room for everybody else to talk this evening. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be at this one all night if I'm not careful. Um, well, thanks for the question, Maddie, and thanks for, thanks for uh, starting with me. I, I, wasn't, I really wasn't expecting it. Um, I, we should have rehearsed. I, I think that, um, you know, when, when we talk about the um, reparations bill, um, I think I just I want to be very careful about talking about the reparations bill because we, first we have to frame it and say you know I'm sorry uh, did I say reparations I'm talking about expungement um, something else in my head um, so there's this um, there's this there's this narrative somehow that that's out there that suggests that if you if you expunge uh, the um, you know these these crimes that uh, were were put on folks for this. Uh, age old uh, war on drugs, then that makes everything okay and we can just go forward with this taxation and regulation. Um, probably what would have made more sense is, is when we legalized marijuana, we should have really been thinking about expungement, quite frankly, if, if you wanna frame this thing right. So we're already having a, a, a conversation that's, that's long overdue. Um, uh, but let's just say hypothetically we're going to have this conversation and we, we say okay well if we put expungements out there then we should be good to go with this well it it really doesn't go towards uh, addressing two major uh, deficiencies two major shortfalls number one is is that you know because of the fact that the average the median wealth of a black family in america is one thirteenth that of a white family before covid and, and because of the fact that the land over, uh, ownership of black folks uh, in Vermont is, uh, is just embarrassing, uh, we really haven't had the conversation about equity as of yet. Uh, so we're talking about, we're talking about you know, the, the ability to enter the market. Uh, we're talking about uh, the ability to be um, viable in the market as well. So there, there's a whole lot of other considerations. So I, so I think that, um, yeah, the expungement bill well, we urged um, the the legislature to to integrate the expungement bill to be a component uh, of to be a, a working component of the um, uh, of the taxation and regulation uh, policy. Uh, we thought it would be good because they would play off on one another, and one wouldn't get across the finish line before the other. Uh, right now, it looks like we are poised to see a taxation and regulation policy that does come across the finish line before. The, uh, before the expungement bill, they should be, um, you know, at best or at least I should say inextricably bound. Uh, we've always thought that. Uh, in fact, I'll just go back to the beginning of the conversation. It, it should have already happened. Expungements should have already happened. Now what you'll find is, is you'll hear Brian Grierson's, you know, you know, doing the song and dance and others are saying, it's just so expensive. There's so much stuff to do. And before this is all over, I'll guarantee you, I'm, I, I, I would bet you a dollar to every dime that it's just not going to happen the way that we thought it was, the expungement uh, piece of it. And, and it's not, 
uh, it's not really going to be um, something that is inextricably uh, bound to this policy. Um, we always said no taxation in, in reg or regulation uh, without reparation, you know, just kind of because it sounds really good and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that um, that was one of the ways that, that we thought from the beginning that this this would be uh, a very, uh, you know, very this would be a very good idea was just to make sure that those policies uh, that, that they were together. I'll tell you one other reason why is, is because they're going to start talking about money. Um, and we're, you know, over here, if you're talking about cannabis taxation and regulation, everybody's talking about money. We're talking about cannabis control board. We're talking about, um, you know, money coming in from integrated folks. We're talking about money coming in from taxes. And we're talking about what to do with the, the, with the uh, excise taxes and so, and so forth. And if we're talking about, you know, 30% to whatever, and, and what, you know, if we're talking about doling out money over here, but we're, and we're saying we have, you know, we have a deficit over here because there's no money available. Um, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. So I think that is kind of the first part of your question. Um, as far as um, the follow on with the, um, you know, as, as if, you know, just going into the, um, the, the issues with the policy, I, I really would like, I prefer to like abbreviate that because it, it it's so much, it, there's a lot that's going on with this policy. I, I don't think, I don't think we throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there are, there are a lot of issues with this policy. I think they can be fixed in, sh in pretty short order. It's just that I don't think that the conference committee, I'm, I don't think anybody, any of us on our, in, in fact, on our coalition believes that the conference committee is the place to fix this because it just doesn't lend to that ability to do so uh, because, because just the work that needs to be done on it. But I think in short, you know, when you start, you know, thinking about, you know, just think about you know, this whole conversation about ag, you know, the, you know, in, you know, this, this product is not agriculture, for example, you say, well, wait a minute, Mark, we're talking about racial justice. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll be there. Um, so you got, you know, the vast majority of black and brown folks, black folk here in, in Vermont, we live in apartments um, because, you know, some of the challenges that I mentioned, I can give you stats about what the numbers are on who owns land as well as who owns property. I can, and I can, I can assure you that the vast majority of us, we live in apartments. This is an apartment. You know, the thing is, is if, if, you know, if you live in an apartment, you, you know, you, you can't grow in here uh, because that, that's, that's an issue. Um, so I think that, you know, that's a, that kind of ties into the conversation that's really important. Um, the other piece of it is, is if it was ag, if we were dealing with something that was ag, um, then those, those, pro those property, um, the, co the property costs, they would, they, they would decrease significantly. So we would be able to look at options for, you know, to, to put out grants for, for land, uh, to be able to le level the playing field in some kind of uh, racial equity strategy. Um, so, and, and then at, at the end of the day, everybody wins because the small growers, um, they also have the opportunity as well um, to, to enter into the market, um, you know, as, as, you know, to give them that kind of opportunity um, because, you know, you're not, you're, you're not restricting this, this product. So, so I think that that's, that kind of ties into the front part of it, but, you know, I see a lag right now. It seems like <clears throat> the small growers, I mean, they can be cultivators up front. But what does that do to BIPOC? What does that when you when you when you're looking at BIPOC folks and you're saying how do you enter the market and win? Well, we got small growers that can't even come in. Um, you know, well they can come in initially, but they can't come into the full market until five months. BIPOC folks, the only opportunity that you're providing us is the ability to be a cultivator within that 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 early period, along with our small growers. Except for one thing, we don't have land or money. So what does that do? What does that do for us? What it does is it puts us at even a more significant uh, disadvantage. And then you, you take a closer look, you know, at how this whole thing is on. And yes, they did sprinkle some very, very moderate um, uh, offers for, say, for example, licensing and, you know, where BIPOC folks, along with minority owned businesses and women and so forth, would have the ability to have some, some you know, m minimum um, advantages, but nothing, nothing major that would compensate for um, just the capital and the land um, short shortfalls. Um, and and, if, and I think here's the kicker. Now, this is the one I was saving for you. Is is that <clears throat> the vast majority of the 
in our opinion, because we're like the old lady that used to run around on the commercial, right? Um, back in the day, who's saying, where's the beef? Uh, because at this point, we're just, even with the, what, what has been offered, we're really not seeing anything substantial. So it is our presumption that what is supposed to be substantial, given the fact that none of the three marijuana commission reports had one word about racial equity. Um, so what we believe is, is the hope, uh, I guess the legislature is hoping that they're gonna send a, a cannabis control board, which doesn't exist right now, um, but that once that board is put together, they've tasked the Cannabis Control Board to go and collaborate with three state agencies. I don't, I don't know if you've ever tried to collaborate with one, but with three state agencies, and then to come back with a recommendation for how they would go about um, considering how black, how BIPOC folks would be addressed in terms of um, this whole idea of racial equity. Now, this. Um, what we know is, is that the, um, the folks who are in our small, gro our small growers and illicit uh, growers and so forth, they're already going to be getting on a, um, a train uh, pretty late. Um, by the time we uh, get ready to get on that train, it will be far out of the station and probably in the next day. Uh, so there, there are some, there's some issues. There's, there's some significant issues. Um, and we've, we've held out as example of things that can be done in terms of, and I wanna just turn that corner of, because the question is always, what do we do? Well, um, first of all, it's not fair to, to ask the BIPOC community once you've left the station, once, once you haven't you know, chosen to address this with, um, with, uh, with uh, data-driven uh, research, uh, with having had the opportunity back well over a year ago when all of those other reports were being done, it's not really fair. Uh, to put us on the spot with those answers, but we can point to Illinois. Illinois is not perfect, but it's leap, it's light years above what we're doing in terms of racial equity uh, with this policy. And we have held that policy out as an, as an example. Uh, so at a minimum, what we should, what we should probably do uh, as we continue to try to get this policy done, maybe even by the, maybe at the top of next year, we can return to the conversation is, is let's get the research done. Let's get, the, let's get the Marijuana Commission back together. Let's task them to go out and, and do the research, the requisite research, so we can get a, a, a solid policy in place. And maybe they can use Illinois and whatever other standards that are out there, best practices, maybe talk to some of the pros that are in the field instead of trying to uh, construct this thing like in-flight plane construction, because this, uh, what they put out, not just for BIPOC community, but even for small growers, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just too little, it is far too late. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think you queued up our next question very well. Um, this question's for Graham. Uh, Graham, what do the current bills, meaning the two versions of S54 passed by the House and Senate, um, what do they offer for small farms um, knowing, you know, rural Vermont's position on this, why do you feel it's not enough? Um, so similar in a similar vein to what I asked Mark, um, what would you like to see in the bill to more adequately include this community? Um, and what are the implications for Vermont farmers if cannabis cultivation is not being considered agriculture, um, as is the case, at least in the House version of S54? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and just to piggyback on Mark, you know, I think the primary thing that we can do for the agricultural community with this bill is to work to realize repairs and reparations related to land and financial wealth in the BIPOC community and communities directly affected by criminalization of cannabis, like Mark was talking about. And, you know, what these bills currently offer is, like Mark was saying, is just sort of um, some ambiguous language around prioritization in the licensure process and a couple spots on the Cannabis Control Board um, to folks representing those communities. And what we're trying to really say is that, you know, the impacts of this war on drugs and of systemic racism in the United States uh, associated with that is goes far beyond this industry. And, um, you know, some form of revenues in perpetuity should be going from this industry in Vermont to these communities um, to determine what to do with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, but so getting directly to agriculture, um, so we have both process and outcome frustrations currently. Um, <clears throat> to begin with sort of the process that went into this bill, we feel like agricultural communities really wasn't largely included. Um, 
neither of these bills passed through either agricultural committee, which is where stakeholders in the agricultural community often go to provide testimony, um, where we would be invited, actively invited to contribute to the conversation. Um, you know, there's a real narrative justifying this bill, which promises that the vast majority of cultivation in Vermont will be warehouses. Uh, it won't be on farms. And this bill was, you know, to some extent written to respond to you. And unfortunately, I think in reality, help actualize this future. Um, when we did testify, we were not encouraged by our reception. You know, we were like, we were told at one point by a committee chair that unless we were here to talk about roadside safety or youth prevention, they weren't interested in hearing our testimony. Um, we were told that they didn't care about the governor's commission's report. Um, and I know ourselves and a number of other stakeholders went to provide testimony there and gave our time um, to provide input there. Um, the Agency of Agriculture does not house regulatory authority, um, although they already do regulate hemp. Um, and you know, the history of persecution of cultivators doesn't present a very welcoming environment for them to come testify in. And I think it would have been great to see a really deliberate process given all the language around reducing barriers to the existing cultivator community for there to be a process inviting those folks in. So this isn't just a matter of, of the outcome that I wanted to speak to. I just wanted to preempt by saying there's some real process issues we'd like to see happen differently as we focus on this bill. So what's currently in the bill um, directly related to agriculture? In terms of our representation and inclusion, um, in the Senate bill, there's a three-person canvas control board. There is one agricultural slash horticultural spot on that board. Um, there's some preference in licensing for small growers, not uh, growers who are not more than 500 square feet. So that would be the um, smallest cultivation tier. <clears throat> and basically the provision says there shall be made uh, reasonable allowances to prioritize this smaller tier um, and the cultivator licenses um, will be accepted and issued first in the licensing process. Um, in terms of the House bill, uh, we see that there's one ag advisor out of 12 uh, advisor positions on the advisory board to the CCB. So there's a little bit of a, bit of a regulatory structure in that bill. And that there's some, again, life licensing preferences. So there's an intent to include and prioritize small local farmers. Um, again, very ambiguous language left up to the Cannabis Control Board to determine what that means. The board shall consider policies for small cultivators. In this case, not more than 1,000 square feet of plant canopy. Um, the smallest tier of cultivator licenses will be prioritized during the initial licensing period. Um, and they'll consider unique needs and risks and try to make reasonable exceptions and accommodations. Um, smallest uh, cultivators would also have the early ability to sell to dispensaries prior to licensed retail being able to sell. Um, so that's what's in the bill um, that we see as sort of some representation and inclusion of, of agriculture and small farmers and some, some language towards equity relation, relationship to ag. Now here's what we find sort of problematic in some of our suggestions. And I think, you know, Maddie, I'll first get to that the last part of your question, which is what if agriculture, this is not considered an agricultural process, uh, product, and if the cultivation of cannabis isn't considered agriculture. Um, so that's currently in the House bill. And why is that an issue? Um, you know, there are a number of, um, so agricultural easements in current use, for example, are two um, programs in place that are specifically in place to facilitate access to land. They're to reduce the economic barriers to keeping that land in agriculture and to people accessing it to begin with. When this, the cultivation of this plant, it wouldn't be considered agriculture. That would mean that the cultivation of this plant couldn't happen on any land in agricultural easement, any infrastructure that was on that land, um, or any land in current use, because all that land has to be used for agricultural use. Um, so this is a, a huge barrier to existing farm operations and also to those who are seeking to lessen their barriers to um, acquiring farmland and engaging with farming. Um, uh, there's provisions in the bills which speak to, um, well, actually, let me get to saying, I think one of the reasons that provision is they went for this non-agricultural option was to address concerns around um, large moneyed interest taking advantage of agricultural exemptions. And um, I think this is one of the things that really could have been sorted out if they had gone to an agricultural committee uh, there are plenty of ways to manage and designate different entities within the agricultural system. Consider dairy, you know, um, dairy, large dairy cooperatives and producers, that infrastructure at St. Albans Creamery is, is not considered agricultural infrastructure. It's not given exemptions related to agricultural zoning. However, you know, crops grown in relationship to that dairy operation 
um, are considered agricultural. So there's means of considering um, differentiating the agricultural exemptions within an industry um, that really weren't considered. Uh, there are provisions really that um, I think provide a lot of barriers to small operations and outdoor growing in general. Um, this is where we see the evidence of it really being written for warehouse type um, growing and indoor growing. Um, quote unquote, enclosed locked facilities required, quote unquote, locked or other security devices, quote unquote, not visible to the public. Um, so from the beginning, we really encouraged legislators to allow the security of outdoor cultivation locations to be at the discretion of the cultivator without referring to rulemaking process of the CCB. Um, it's really impractical for a, a small farm operation. And the smallest here is currently in one of these bills, 500 square feet of canopy space or a thousand square feet. You're, you're not talking much space. And people who have access to land sometimes really can't control how visual it is to the public. Um, the practicality of fencing in uh, a field, uh, especially if you're trying to do things like crop rotation, et cetera, and keeping under lock and key is really impractical. Um, so we also see restrictions and or limitations on the number of visitors to farms. And I think one of the primary concerns that we really see as a, an organization working on community scale agriculture is a lack of direct market opportunities for small scale producers. Um, small scale producers cannot compete with the economies of scale that wholesale producers um, rely on. So we really need those direct market opportunities. Uh, we need the craft opportunities to develop that relationship um, with our, our customers and consumers and to develop a product that's clearly, clearly defined. Um, this is really a product that can go straight from the field, um, more or less to the farm stand. And we'd really like to, you know, give this a tier of cultivators, you know, the opportunity to engage in direct market sales. Um, we should start from an equitable place, equitable place. What we've been told is, well, at some point we'll get there. Um, but again, we shouldn't be starting from a fundamentally inequitable place. We should do the work to start from an equitable place. Um, the licensing process, you know, in one of the bills, it really favors existing dispensaries in the house bill. And, you know, the time is limited in both. Um, we really think that uh, the license application, the license, the applications and um, should be issued on an ongoing basis and without restrictions for the smallest tier of cultivation. We should really be trying to get as many people in the door as possible. And that means sort of opening up that door to the smallest tier that brings in the existing economy. And it allows really any various people who are, are just beginning, are trying to figure out if this is something they want to do. Um, and to people who just don't have the economic resources to really enter in at a larger scale. Um, the existing dispensary privileges are really striking in these bills and they really create a market share issue. Um, we've asked, we basically would ask that the licensing priorities um, are struck from this bill. The ability to operate as retail and medical would be struck from the bill. The ability to vert vertically integrate under one license would be struck from the bill. The ability for these entities to test themselves. And in one bill, um, if they were to pursue independent testing, it would be paid for by the public. So we would like all of that struck from the bill. These are other for-profit businesses that should be treated equitably with other for-profit businesses in the marketplace. Um, criminal background checks, really unnecessary and invasive burden on businesses and for individuals. And it's unclear you know, what would disqualify anybody from this industry. It's again, left up to the CCB. So that's both the criminal justice reform issue and a small business concern issue. And really there's too much ambiguous language leaving decisions to the Cannabis Control Board and the lack of including the agency of ag. Um, we would love to see a preference and priority for small cultivator licenses versus um, the ongoing provision of smallest tier and more clearing how prioritization will actually be manifest. Um, they've really specifically given certain prioritization to, to dispensaries and other things, and I think they really could have taken the time to articulate um, what some of these privileges would be as opposed to just provide ambiguous language to try to satisfy us without really including our voices. Uh, I'll leave it there and see if anybody else has anything to include on this. Did anybody else, did any other panelists want to chime in on that question before I move to the next one? I just want just a quick follow up. Um, that was fantastic, Graham. I just want to mention that um, the original language for the craft cultivator license was detailed at 500 square feet for total canopy size. Um, that is an impractical canopy size. No one, no family can make their living uh, with that with that total canopy size. The average uh, uh, canopy size in Vermont, and we have an annual poll out, uh, is in Vermont about 1,200 square feet. Uh, that is, uh, you know, we're, if we're uh, apples and oranges, we're looking at like a dairy farm. We're talking about a dairy farm with one cow, right? So 
there are there are practicalities here, uh, and it did get bumped up to a uh, thousand square feet, uh, but it was originally defined at what really is perceived as a clear barrier to entry. Um, but uh, yep. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, this next question is actually for you. Um, I would love it if you could explain a little bit more, um, because I know you've been following this closely, what some of the implications are of giving municipalities the choice to opt in versus opting out, uh, which is done differently in each of the bills. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, municipalities having the ability to opt in or opt out of having cannabis establishments in their communities. Um, and then I'll give you a follow up. Let's start with that one. I mean, that's a great question. Um, we get this asked all the time. Um, what does opt in and opt out even mean? Um, you know, what, what are these phrases? How would that impact me? Um, we have lots of retailers uh, that are members of EGA, uh, individuals. These are families, uh, you know, mind you, that have been carting people for alcohol. They're, they know the ins and the outs of the security and the nuances of dealing with state and regulation. They safely uh, distribute uh, and retail product. Um, so, you know, uh, this is not really anything new to them. Um, and, and they ask me, you know, what do these things mean? Um, and, and really what it comes down to is, is pathways to the marketplace. Um, how accessible uh, a, a local mom and pop uh, business or even an individual uh, who's thinking about uh, entering the marketplace what we would probably label as a cottage industry, a successful cottage industry, which is really the backbone of Vermont. Um, all of our craft industries uh, tend to have that sort of strong foundation with clear accessible pathways. So what we're saying is let's make sure that our uh, craft cannabis marketplace is no different. Let's not put in the effort to make exceptions, to make it so different from everything else. And that's what this opt-in, opt-out uh, uh, situation would present. Uh, an opt-in would create what we like to consider a patchwork of different policies throughout the state. And this is not us, um, you know, just rhetorically coming up with this. Other states have been doing this now. There's 11 states in this country uh, that have uh, legalization. Eight of them have a commercial market. So we can turn to instances of um, some of these states that have similar bills uh, that have passed in the law as S-54. And we can turn and see how they're performing, uh, how their market and how their residents and how their small businesses are reacting to some of those policies and statutes. And opt-in, opt-out is one of those. Uh, the House version, I believe, has opt-out, and I believe the, or rather, the Senate version has uh, opt-out, and the House version has opt-in. We prefer opt-in, uh, speaking for uh, the members of Vermont Growers Association. These are businesses that are already operating for the most part. Um, Let's step back for a moment. Vermont already has a cannabis industry. We have a vivid marketplace right now. We want to make sure that these actors are allowed to transition successfully into this legal space. We want to capture that revenue. They want to pay taxes. Let's allow them to do that. Opt-in and opt-out is the crux of one of these barriers to entry. If, it, if the uh, Senate bill were to pass and we have opt-out, we would have a more uniform policy statewide um, in that uh, local businesses would not have to go to their towns to petition the town to engage in this legal market. That's what opt-in is. Opt-in would be navigating the municipalities to try and convince them through select boards or town councils uh, before a retailer can uh, um, operate in, in, in that municipality, before a grower can cultivate. Who can navigate that terrain in an opt-in better than uh, a mom and pop are these large out-of-state entities. They have the resources. They maybe even have the staff. Um, this is what we see in other states. So it's really a clear barrier to entry. In addition to having confusing patchwork law, uh, imagine just for a moment uh, out-of-state travelers, tourists coming in. Imagine how unclear that would be to them. Um, I, I find a bed and, back, bed and breakfast in this town. I have to look up whether or not, you know, I can get a beer, right? That, that, that's, not, that's not sensible. That's not, that's not reasonable. So we want uniform, clear policy throughout the state. We want access to tax revenue for local municipalities. We want opt-out policy. Um, and we want to make it uh, as easy as possible, not regulation-free, but as easy as possible for 
our local Vermonters, and let's be frank, a lot of them are struggling right now, especially economically with the pandemic. They're wondering, uh, you know, where their rent's going to come from next month. Let's give them that security with this bill. As of this moment, this bill doesn't provide that security for our families across Vermont. Um, and so the opt-in, opt-out mechanism plays into that. Let's ensure that we have clear, uh, under, understandable uh, regulations and guidelines for everyone, uh, and not just for those who can afford lobbyists to come in and navigate these unique exceptions. Um, so that's how we would uh, address the opt-in, opt-out um, argument in, in cannabis legal, legal space. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That's really helpful to understand. Um, I'm actually going to kick it over because I want to hear from Elisa and Jesse. Um, and this is sort of a question that's one question I'm posing to both of you. Um, so we'll start with Elisa and then um, Jesse, I'll, I'll move to you. Based on your experience in the industry um, and Elisa, in your, in your case, across um, several different states, um, and you mentioned, you know, indoor and outdoor grows and in different markets. Um, what do you envision as the future of our regulated marketplace here in Vermont? And what would you like to see um, prioritized? Um, well, I, I want to give props to Graham right now because the... Um, you made so many good points, but having giving people like the opportunities to learn if it's <laughs> for them in terms of cultivation, the education is really important in this. And I think that um, articulating the equity within it is really important. I think as a farmer, uh, keeping it in an agricultural mindset is important for cultivation um, and opportunities. And um, you know, realistic taxes and and um, and just access to a high quality product that's affordable um, instead of it being just the cheapest thing that you could get um, because that's not medicine. Um, but uh, yeah, what what you guys have all been saying is is resonating so much with me, and also culturally, it's kind of like. As Jeff was saying, there is a thriving, vivid market here, um, and people do want to transition. And it's it has been primarily, you know, people that are just doing homegrown things. Um, and like Mark was saying, there's not always access to people living in apartments who can grow. Um, so just I see it as creating access to everybody and to really promoting. Um, this like craft quality of product um, in this space. Well, thank you, Elisa. Um, and Jesse, same question to you, just you know, to reiterate, based on your experience um, as a grower and in the industry, what do you envision in, um, in our marketplace and what would you want to prioritize? Um, so first of all, you know, um, we're, we're, we're new to sort of um, this whole marketplace. Um, having been starting a farm so recently. But a big thing for me, you know, that I see is, first of all, the ag oversight. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I believe that we all would love to see this be overseen by the ag department. Uh, we already have the infrastructure in place for that. Um, education, we would love to see more education. I think there's just so much miseducation out there uh, surrounding all of this. And so many people still have so many questions unanswered. And we, um, as a small farm and as a community, just need to continue to get out that sort of information and help people re-understand what we're cultivating and why it's so important. And that kind of leads me also to sort of the environmental impacts of also growing, um, because we really would like to see an emphasize or an emphasis on that, that um, sun, soil grown. Um, cultivating um, is it has has uh, you know its real benefit, you know, and in, in to Vermont and to Vermont farmers um, that already exist and that can exist, and um, we would like to also obviously see the Vermont craft cannabis thrive because it's what we do already as a state. We're very good at that. We're very good at branding um, what we do um, and equanimity. I mean, of course, first and foremost. Um, for, for all growers to have a, a chance to do what we all strive to do and grow a business and, and improve our community and, um, and, and be able to, uh, like Elisa said too, grow the, grow the best product we possibly can. 
you know, and that's what we deserve to do for our fellow Vermonters and beyond. So. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I guess kind of getting back along the same vein, um, I had another question for you, Jeffrey, and also anybody else feel free to weigh in on this, but I was wondering if you could describe um, the existing ownership or the ownership of the existing medical dispensaries, um, how those are privileged in this bill, and how the bill currently does or does not provide opportunities for equitable market share across Vermont businesses. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, and this sort of speaks to you know, what we like to characterize as um, status quo cannabis legislation, right? In the backdrop of what's happening nationally, um, there's, there's lots of movements, there's lots of um, ideas being exchanged in terms of, uh, you know, uh, funding and appropriating uh, our, our public works and, and different uh, public services. Um, you know, status quo cannabis legislation likes to lead with uh, pre-existing market actors. So who are pre-existing market actors in this state? Well, we've got, we don't have a rec space uh, yet. We've got uh, a medical marijuana space. So our dispensary owners, uh, there's five of them. There's five uh, locations. There's four businesses that run them. Uh, one business is the uh, Champlain Valley Dispensary is the only one that is uh, independently run. Uh, it is um, owned by Vermonters. The others are out-of-state entities. Um, and really, those are the primary drivers of this bill, uh, which, which we see time and time again. Uh, this is not unique to Vermont. Um, specifically, we're talking about uh, Cure Leaf Holdings, um, grassroots and Ianthus, and these are major players, not just in Vermont, but elsewhere. I mean, I think grassroots got, has like a dozen locations in Illinois alone. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. Um, and really those are the primary beneficiaries of this bill as of this moment in time. Um, and so, you know, if we just take a back, take, take a step back and look at our, our medical industry, um, you know, is it successful right now? Um, we're probably the only state in the nation where we actually have patients wanting to move away from our medical program. Um, and there's several reasons why. Uh, one of the reasons is because they don't see themselves getting uh, uh, effective medication or clean, honest medication from these actors. Um, these actors, if you look in other states in the rec market, you know, they, they tend to be you know, large uh, indoor facilities we can kind of consider them big ag in a way. Think about you know the the products, the vegetables that we get in our grocery stores versus maybe the organic sort of smaller scale craft vegetables that you get in the grocery store. So that's really what we're dealing with here. Um, you know, this is um, they they deal in market share and market access. So uh, S fifty four very much allows them to, uh, as they have the medical space, capture our rec space, uh, even if it's four or five months or or what, whatever the explanation is, uh, it's not acceptable. Uh, this is 2020. Um, wh why are we uh, you know, even talking about uh, giving these pre-existing actors who already have a leg up? They've got financing, they've got cultivation operations, they've got the read, they have everything that they need. Um, we're not saying uh, poo-poo them, we're not demonizing them, we're simply saying, let's just make sure that everyone has the same access, the same tools that they have. So in 2020, you know, maybe we, we should be starting the conversation. How can we have our BIPOC community? How can we have those most harmed by prohibition and maybe the struggling small business owners? How can we have them lead this market um, as opposed to maybe uh, these established actors who are already doing pretty well, who already have an entire market to themselves? Um, so that is a little bit of a definition of uh, the current uh, sort of cannabis actors in our state. Uh, and then also within the context of um, the emerging rec market. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I just have a couple more questions before we move into Q&A. And um, to come back around, I think, to, to where we started, Mark, I'm curious to know um, what do you think would be like the most meaningful steps that the legislature could take right now to start a process of engaging um, with the BIPOC community in a productive way. Let's take uh, let's let's take about sixty seconds and take a break for George Floyd and Jacob Je and Jacob Blake.
Black Lives Matter. I think that um, the truth is, is that the legislature is not listening. Hard stop. <clears throat> the, um, the reason why there's people standing outside the police station not far from my house right now, and they've been there for the last five days is because folks aren't listening. The reason why the Kerner report was necessary is because folks weren't listening. Um, and even dogs, if you kick them long enough, they'll bite you. Uh, and I think that uh, at some point or another, uh, what that really precipitates is, is just the need to want to put, a, want to put them down and, and ask yourself the question, why does that dog bite me? I don't have no idea why that dog bit me. I guess we need to do something about him. Law and order. So I think that, um, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, if we knew how to get the legislature to listen to us, then, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, you know, I think part of it is not the BIPOC community trying to get the legislature to listen to them. It's actually the white community to try to get the to, to influence the legislature to listen to the BIPOC community, especially in a 94.5% white state. I think that, um, you know, the, um, you know, just like Caleb said just a minute ago, uh, you know, he's, he's saying, look, this, you know, I think that this thing is just inherently, this market is inherently favoring uh, white folks, you know, if you were to advance it. Um, and he's right uh, in his comments. And we, we had our coalition, we had this, I had this conversation with the folks in the coalition a little while ago as we were beginning to strategize. And I said, folks, if this thing passed, you win. You know, almost everything that you say about the favor that the integrated business has, as you look at them, as we look at you, we see similar favor. It goes like this, integrated, small growers, enlisted market, us. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous that we would need to sit around and try to convince folks that it's a bad idea to add seat belts to this law. Are you kidding me? That's just like a red herring or something like that. It's just, there's so many distractions. Act 54, which we put forward, and passed racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, the attorney generals in the human rights commission's um, task force to all systems of state government indicated that there are racial disparities across all systems of state government, housing, education, employment, health services access, economic development, okay? It's a legislative report. So it's, it's not a, and I'm not suggesting that all legislators read everything, but what I'm saying is, is we've, we've had this conversation, we've come to understand, we created a position of uh, racial equity executive director. As hard as we fought to get what we wanted in that, all we got was a director, one person, and they assigned her everything except for a cape to do her job um, because she has, she's basically all over the place and has no staff. We can't even get them to give her staff. Uh, so the, the, this conversation, I mean, what else is ridiculous? Let's add saliva testing to the bill. So they've got us, you know, we're, we're being distracted with these silly arguments. Uh, we're being given crumbs in terms of what it is that um, we're asking for in terms of equity. And, and I think that Illinois policy is one of many, but it's, well, a couple, maybe that it spell out, you know, in, in the, it's the same thing, you know, the same thing with any other system uh, that we're struggling in because there are folks right now, you know, you know, don't get me started on the education system for the BIPOC community in Vermont and the challenges that we're facing in, in that system. Um, don't get me started on, you know, we talk about land access and it's easy to blink and move on, but this, these are serious implications. You know, when you start talking about the fact that, you know, 
60% of folks are just in the city of Burlington, here where I live, 60% of all the housing here is rented, okay? And, and then you think about the BIPOC community, overlay that with the economics. There's a lot of serious challenges. You know, we got reports coming out of legal aid that 50% of the time, black people are being discriminated against when they go rent. So there's a whole lot of other conversations that we're having and a lot of other fights that we're fighting. Uh, so what do we, how do we get the legislature to listen to us on this? White people, particularly people in this industry or those folks who have had uh, success in one way or another or folks who are fighting for themselves have to understand that our, our, our ability to, um, to succeed uh, by finding equity in this market uh, is it, it really is, it hinges on the fact, it must hinge upon the fact that we are inextricably bound. There is only one, 1%. And I don't think any of, those, any of us on this call are them. So with the same vigor and with the same intensity, um, lest you become hypocritical, um, you know, it's kind of like an idea of fighting for freedom from the crown in Europe while you got slaves. Lest we become hypocritical, that fight needs to come from all of us. I hope that helps. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, I guess I'll just close before we move on to um, questions. And also I should clarify, I had um, suggested that folks write their questions in the chat, which some folks have been doing. So we'll get to any questions that are in the chat and also folks have been putting them in the Q and A. Um, so we will get to questions in both of those places once we move on. Um, yeah, I guess I would just, you know, put the question I, I put to Mark. Um, to each of you, if you you know want to add anything um, before we move to Q and A, just how how do you see the legislature, um, or or how would you ask the legislature, demand that the legislature meaningfully engage um, you and your community in this policy discussion? Maddie, do you want to call us one by one or should we oh, stop? Yeah, you go first, Graham. <laughs> um, you know, I think I mentioned a couple things, but, you know, right now, you know, this coalition, the, the um, organizations represented this call at least are, are, are calling to stop the process now in conference committee and start again you know, in the next session. And that doesn't mean, uh, I know one of the critiques is we have to start from scratch. I mean, we do have, a, a, you know, parts of bills, but there's such a substantial amount of them we've all pointed to that is problematic. And what we'd really like to see is some difference in process. Um, so, you know, I mentioned in my comments that this building go through either agricultural committee. Let's, let's, that is the place where agricultural concerns are, are largely heard in the state house. Let's make sure that happens. Let's make sure there's a pro process for, um, dealing with the, the taboo and the real risk that that current market that does exist, which Jeffrey has talked about, um, feels. Um, I think there's a process in place to hear from hear from them if they're serious about bringing these people in. Um, and, and likewise, you know, um, let's see a more deliberate engagement with, with BIPOC communities um, and with, with um, small businesses and cultivators in general and organizations that uh, represent them. So that's, that's where I like to see the start is really in the process and we'll get to the outcomes through that process. Thanks, Graham. Um, Elisa, how would you answer that? I think that, I think that what's also kind of involved is to consider the fact that cannabis over beer, over cheese, over dairy, has had its own culture through the years. It's existed in the illicit market and all other places on a culture, not just of farmers, but um, the prohibition of it was essentially based on racism, right? In the 30s, it was outlawed because of racist uh, motivations. So I think, you know, I say education, but it, it's a cultural thing too, where we have to kind of consider the system, 
learn kind of where all of our blind spots are and learn kind of what what is holding it back, but be it corporations or limiting um, access, but to learn all that stuff, unlearn it, relearn it, and kind of reiterate it as something that's like beneficial to everyone, gives access to everyone, and isn't just kind of like regulatory compliance things. And, um, and to give everybody, to give people the opportunity to really um, be able to participate it not just in a cultivation sense there's so many businesses and there's so many ancillary services around it um but really first to kind of like level the playing field and what it is understand how we have a relationship with it for the culture that it has existed around it and the one that you want to create in vermont going forward incorporating everyone thank you um, Jesse, what do you think? So I, I, I'd really like to see the, the small businesses grow. I mean, that's, that's what we do really well here. I mean, in the state and coming back to the sort of ag oversight and going back to the, um, yes, bringing in, bringing the bill back would, um, would allow us to sort of relook look at that. And I think go forward with that sort of, again, view of equanimity. And I mean, that's really where we're coming from. And for, for me um, and our sort of uh, business, we would like to sort of see it go in that direction. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're here to sort of support that in any way we possibly can. Thanks, Jesse. Um, Jeff, you wanna give us a, a closing statement before we move to Q&A? Sure, I can follow up on process. Uh, the, the issue that uh, Graham and others and Mark have raised, um, do, do, do our communities feel included in this process? Does the cannabis community, which exists, uh, feel excluded from this legislative process? It does. It does. Um, there's lots of value that we can add. Um, you know, we will ultimately be the market. It's just a matter of time. Um, Vermont will never uh, compete with commodity. Uh, we are a craft uh, uh, state. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that um, um, yeah, and what, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> I think you. I think you started to get at it. It was basically just how can the legislature, you know, engage with these communities? Um, oh, okay, so absolutely. You, yeah. Um, yeah. Just just to add to that, um, you know, one of the things that we see uh, reflective of that level of engagement is inclusion in this in this bill. So one of the things that we see that the dispensaries have managed to get into this bill is upfront fees. Uh, so we're talking money now. Um, so this legislative process allowed specific actors to value themselves, but not every other Vermonter. No one else was given that opportunity. So what do I mean by that? Poise that question towards Vermont farmers to small businesses, to retailers. Are they willing to put up $1,000, $1,200, whatever it is that they can afford to then value themselves as an inclusionary actor in this market? Um, we see that being demonstrated for some actors, but not for others. So that's that's underscoring, that's highlighting some of that inequality in the process that we're talking about. Um, I can say uh, without a doubt, um, and without speaking to all of them, but I've spoken to a lot of them, retailers would be comfortable uh, um, joining the dispensaries with giving uh, the state uh, upfront uh, fees to move this legislation forward. We were never asked. So getting back to process, let's have a more holistic process. Um, let's arrive at market faster. S54 just takes way too long to arrive at a market. Um, we can do this much quicker. We can arrive at actualized tax revenue much more quickly and more of it if we start a process that includes everyone and not just maybe those with big pockets. Thanks, Jeff. Maddie? Yeah. Can I, can I just add to that, just to piggyback on the part of what Graham started was, is that I think, I think it's really important. I know this question isn't really going there, but I think it's really important as we 
take the arc on this and, and think about you know, what is really sitting in the um, conference committee right now. It's, it's based upon what we've just laid out right now. And I know that there's a lot of folks who see dollars, see dollar signs, and they're like, oh my God, we can find, or there's a lot of folks like the commenter on the, um, the um, chat said, you know, well, we're gonna be last in the market. In the, is it more important for us to, you know, the, is it more important, you know, is the time frame in which the, the state, you know, generates, begins to generate money in this market? Or is the fact that, you know, our market, you know, you know, emerges, you know, quickly. So we are competitive with our other markets in New England. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to get, you know, get, get my head around this and help folks think about that is, is what are our priorities here? You know, are, are we, is, is that really, are those priorities more valuable? Are, are we the people, the kind of folks here in this state that say, yeah, you know, instead of being fair, we want to be fast. You know, instead of being equitable, we want to be profitable. You know, is that really who, I mean, and I'm, I know who I am. The question is, is who are you? Because that is, that is not, that's, that's not, that, that's not my ethic. That's not my standard. Those are not my values. And I, I really don't believe that that's what we should represent in terms of values. I think, I think we can fix this. I think we can do it in relatively short order if there's the political will to do so. And I think the problem here is, is that the political will does not exist today. That is the real problem. You know, and, and we're just calling this thing out. And, I, and what I really believe here is, is that if you think hard about what's going on under the Golden Dome, and, and I, can, I have direct experience of, about voluminous testimony regarding uh, oversight of law enforcement, and we essentially have none, almost none, okay? And these things are, these things are connected, these conversations that we're having. And it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're talking about political and economic power. And maybe at the end of the day, we just don't get what we want, but I think we push as hard as we can to hold them accountable and make them say it. Because what we're doing, we, we shouldn't be allowed to, it should not be, it is not right that we're simply dismissed for reasons of speed or, or reasons of, or, or of competitiveness or, and I think out of hand initially it was, was, well, they just don't know what they're talking about, which is ridiculous. So I, so I think we, if nothing else, this coalition is shining a light on something that is real, okay? And if, if nothing else, when this thing takes out of the gate, everybody will know that it wasn't right, we didn't agree with it, and we stood on good principles in our disagreement. Well, I think we're done here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it to Q&A. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm gonna start with the questions that are in the actual, um, yeah, total mic drop. I'm gonna start with the Q&A box and I'm gonna just let any panelists who wanna take a question, just like raise your hand and go for it. Um, these aren't directed at specific people, but if you if you wanna take a question, go ahead. Uh, this first question is from um, Johanna Miranda. Hey, Joe. Um, she says, Illinois was referenced by Mark as a good example for Vermont to follow. What specifically in the Illinois plan, um, what specifically is in the Illinois plan that makes it good? And what can we glean from it and inc to include in the Vermont plan? So yeah, um, there are some things in the Illinois plan that are good. I kind of anticipated that question come up. It's, it is, you know, respectfully, it's kind of tiring to have to go back to it because it's really the legislator's job having given uh, our language um, that has been tailored around this plan. I'm glad to post this up. In fact, um, Maddie, you can just drop it if you have it. I think somebody has it. You can just drop this document. Jeff, maybe you have it. Uh, it's, it's sloppy and everything, but it went out to the legislature uh, at the beginning of the year, I think it was. Here are a few of those things. And the Cannabis Development Fund, uh, to provide interest uh, rate loans to social equity applicants uh, to pay for ordinary necessary expenses to start an operated cannabis business establishment to provide grants and qualified social equity applicants 
um, to pay for ordinary and necessary expenses uh, at the start at uh, sorry to start and operate cannabis businesses uh, to this this is what the the uh, cannabis development fund that we propose would be doing to compensate the cannabis control board for any costs related to the provision of low interest uh, grants to qualified social equity applicants uh, to pay for outreach um, that may provide that, that may be provided to to target it. Uh, or targeted to attract and support social equity applicants. And that goes on. Um, it, all of the monies uh, in this section would be collected from integrated licenses issued. Um, this would be, uh, we were proposing at the end of last year that it would be um, as soon as practical after the 1st of July of, I should say this year, uh, that the, the comptroller would order the treasurer to also take uh, $1.2 million from the medical cannabis revenue uh, and, to, um, and put it in um, the business development fund. Uh, we also talked about diverting, um, uh, the, the treasurer would divert 10% of tax revenue for cannabis regulation fund to cap at $2 million to the cannabis business fund. Um, I'll just end with a couple of other things, uh, looking over at the integrated license folks. These are just some of the things we put out there as ideas. Um, that the um, the cannabis uh, development fund would be three percent of the. Um, so this, what this is, is uh, for folks who are applying for integrated licenses, that there would be a non-refundable cannabis development fund fee for each one of the folks applying for integrated licenses. That would be equal to three percent of the dispensing organization's total sales between a one year period preceding that and that, um, and that would cap out at a hundred thousand dollars or, or, or it would be, um, or less than that, whichever one is less. Um, the, um, the, each one of these integrated um, licensees, they would also be required to do one of the following, and I, I, will, I won't belabor the point because we're getting late here, is, is to make a contribution of 3% of their total sales um, uh, or $100,000, whichever is less, to the Cannabis uh, Business Development Fund. We've already talked about some of the things that fund is going to be doing. I think I talked about loans and so forth. Um, but you could imagine, um, to make a grant of 3% of the total sales, um, and, and that would be, uh, or $100,000, whichever is less to the cannabis industry training or education program uh, at a community college uh, as defined. Uh, so anyway, and I'll just use this last one, and there are more. Uh, make a donation of $100,000 or more to a program that provides job training services uh, to persons recently incarcerated or that operate uh, in disproportionately impacted areas, which were defined elsewhere in the policy. I appreciate the question. Hopefully that helps. If I can just add some, some Illinois specific items as well that I think our, maybe our coalition and BJ would like to see. Um, Specifically, Illinois used pre-existing state agencies for their regulatory body. They arrived at market at a fraction of the time that S-54 does. They didn't set up a, a, a select committee. Then that committee set it up, you know, uh, appointed new people and those people, none of that. The, the infrastructure is in place. Uh, Illinois' Department of Agriculture was already uh, managing hemp. Uh, so it was just a matter of maybe filling a couple more staff. It's... So th that also, and then speaking to process just for a brief moment, they had social equity as the framework for their bill. So through executive order, upon that bill passing, their governor signed uh, automatic expungement. So that really speaks to some, uh, I want to say, distinctions between our bill that we're talking about and the Illinois bill that became law. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Mark. And I would encourage um, everyone who is on the call to um, to check out that full statement from the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, lest any legislators or others convince you that uh, that no concrete ideas have been put forward, um, I think that document makes it pretty clear that they have been. Um, okay, next question from the Q&A. Uh, Cody is asking, as Vermonters, what can we do to get them to rewrite S54 or new legislation, and what would that timeline look like? Um, I think we've, we've kind of covered it. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in briefly on that. Well, I don't, 
I don't, well, first of all, how you get legislators to do anything is you tell them a whole lot of times from a lot of people consistently over a, you know, a short period of time and make eighth graders in green jackets run up and down the halls with pink envelopes. That's how you make Vermonters do things. Uh, and I think um, that's the uh, legislators. And, and what that means, and they, and they also have to know that everybody's watching and, and that they look very bad. Uh, that's how legislators do things in Vermont. Um, and, and I think that, um, yeah, I, I believe that, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of re, you know, necessarily a complete throw out and rewrite. Um, I, I think that, you know, the framework, what, what Maddie just sent you was actually at the time of crossover, I grabbed the sentence version of the bill and took a lot of the language that already exists. I think I, I don't, I don't know what we did. We ended up with maybe the outcome was a little bit different than I think it is, but I, but I, I do think that what would need to be done is is not a a lot of rocket science in the absence. And I just want to you know stress this is you know it, this was done in the absence of if you will the. Um, the data-driven approach that they should have taken, the data-driven approach that they took on public safety with the report that came out of the Marijuana uh, Commission, um, the, the same thing with uh, you know the whole idea of taxation and regulation. All, you know, I'm not saying they completely paid attention to the, um, the governor's uh, Marijuana Commission, but there was a lot of time and effort and a lot of deliberation that went into those three reports that came out and they just simply didn't do that with this uh, racial equity piece at all. Uh, but so what you can do is, is maybe you can start by telling them to do their job and to go and get that report done uh, so we can actually so so they don't have to solely rely upon, um, you know, the input that was provided by by BIPOC folks here in the state who happen to grab the best friggin policy that exists in the United States and drop it in their laps. And they still didn't look at it. If you could just write all that down so we can refer back to it, I think that would be really helpful, Mark. <laughs> um, I was kind of just saying in a real, um, yeah. in a real sort of more pragmatic thing, like, you know, the, there's, I think all of our organizations have put out communications that have contact information for the conference committee members, or the committee of conference members. <laughs> um, and, you know, your personal, your representatives who, um, from your county or your, your region, um, you know, other organizations you think would be interested in supporting this cause and understanding why this coalition doesn't doesn't do that um, and just spreading the word. So those are some of the things I think of. Um, yep, and I'm dropping a couple links um, in the chat here for everybody that link to uh, the the Justice for All petition um, on this issue that has already over 400 signatures, and um, it would be great to see more. And then. Um, a link to the Vermont Growers page where we have uh, an action alert to contact the conference committee members. Um, you can do both of those things as soon as we're off this webinar. Betty, do we have, uh, we, we have all of the uh, conference committee, I'm sorry, I, maybe I, I'm thinking Graham may have just said this. We have all the con conference committee members contact information out there? I don't know if we have them yet, but I can throw those in the chat too. Uh, just to make it as direct as possible. Which I think no, I'll, have, um, I'll have somebody post on our end and we'll, we'll get a communication up on the site just so folks can have, have something static too. Yeah, that's a great plan. Yeah, I don't um, think we mentioned, but Maddie did mention that, you know, there are two petitions that have existed for months um, with substantial numbers of people uh, signing on against this bill. Um, Vermont Growers and uh, um, through Dehala Dudley, I believe, put out uh, a petition of hemp growers. Over 200 hemp growers in the state have signed on against. Jeff, we might have an update on that. And like Maddie just mentioned, Mark's petition of over 400 people who signed on to Justice for All's petition against this. So we we are communicating um, this, despite the fact that we haven't really felt heard. Uh, okay, I'm gonna move us to the next question. Um, Cody also asked, what ideas do, do the panelists have to build a craft market that melds with our hospitality and tourism industry like Napa has for wine? I, I would like to hear uh, Jesse and Elisa and, and, and Graham and Mark and others speak to this, but really it's, 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 it's the opposite of S54. We, we talked in opt-in out. We, let's remove those barriers to entry so we can have things like 
destination locations, uh, just like Hill Farmstead, right? We have, uh, who, who's the brewer at Hill Farmstead, Sean Hill? We have the Sean Hill already. Let's give them, let's give them the tools that they need to attract those sales. So, so we can have that local multiplier effect, right? With S54, we have five corporate outlets. So we've got towns wondering, am I gonna be passed by? Uh, if I, you know, if I, if I uh, am a BIPOC and I run a small bed and breakfast or something, you're not going to get any of that uh, from, from this bill. Um, so, so really, you know, speaking to ag as well, um, if this was considered more of an agriculture product, um, think wine, cheese, beer, we can have things like place of origin, unique characteristics to the land that speak for marketing purposes, which is exactly the wheelhouse for Vermont. Um, but I would like to hear what others have to say. I think there's a lot we could be doing that just hasn't even been explored. Yeah, just a, a quick thing on that. California is doing this new like certification program, which is like, I think it's called Beyond Earth um, and Soil. So it's it's essentially a process of creating regions of Tawa in Northern California, similar and Appalachians similar to wine, because, you know, in California, Northern California and Southern Oregon, that land, that um, elevation, that water, that sun makes it a really wonderful place to thrive, just like wine, just like the industries here. So I think it's, and talking about land stewardship and, you know, um, resource conservation goals and things like that, Vermont can do that. And there are temp pieces and businesses in place that already do that. So I think bringing it to people, showing people um, these places where it grows or the process of which it is, or holding small events that you can kind of introduce people to different things and make it, you know, approachable instead of just showing up at a dispensary and being like, ah, look at all these different products that I have no idea about, you know, to have it be in front of you and to be able to kind of have tasting tasting menus or you know meals or whatever uh, that Vermont already does really well is is very translatable for for marijuana. I, think. I would I would just add to that that Vermont does it well and and Vermont does it white, uh, and I think that um you know there's this again this this is an interesting conversation because uh, as as we continue. Uh, having these discussions and we start thinking about things like land access, we start thinking about Act 250, you know, the fact that the Act 250 report that went from a year study, it too uh, had not one word about racial equity in it. This was a 50 year review of land access in Vermont. Okay, so I just want to keep the conversation on the tracks because uh, this is real. This is real to us. How we came across the cannabis industry and that concern was exploring possible uh, cultural easements uh, in Vermont and what we might do for land access across Vermont for BIPOC. And we're, we're not there yet. We've got a whole lot more conversation to have. Yes, play, playing off of Mark, I think that, you know, um, part of having a craft industry is having those producers. And we can really have the opportunity to provide an environment that invites in um, a whole community of producers who have been violently displaced in the land over a period of time. We could, we have the opportunity to really create something new here that's a different type of craft than I think the question may have originally intended, which is just like a unique place where people are invited to have a small business, to have a relationship with land, to be able to live uh, well in their community and their place in that respect um, through this bill. There's a lot of revenue, which that's been the primary topic of this bill. That's what folks, the state really seems to be after. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard from, from some existing growers is not only to think about craft in terms of the, the product too, but to think about um, craft in terms of the breeding. And that we live in a really unique climate. Um, and if you have a, you know, a lot of small, if we can actually put this into small growers hands, you have a whole diversity of, of, of craft. And that's what it really comes down to is uniqueness. You can, not only growing a unique product, but you're you're developing breeding stock that is unique globally as well. Thank you all. That was, those are great um, great answers. And I think you know, kind of what we're getting at 
I, I told myself I wasn't going to jump in. I'm just a facilitator, but I really feel like what we're painting is this really, and I want folks on the call and I want everyone really who um, sees messaging coming from our coalition that just says oppose S54. That's only because that's the immediate first step that we see that needs to happen in order to build this really, really positive and exciting and proactively inclusive um, cannabis marketplace that we need. I think like we all came together because we believe that we can do so much better and we have the expertise and the knowledge um, both, you know, on the advocacy side and on the grower side and at every level of this conversation um, to really bring forward something that meets our goals. And as Mark alluded to, you know, aligns with our values in a way that this bill really does not right now. Um, speaking for myself and I think for, for, I think all of us on the call, at least um, on the panel. So um, I think we have time for one more question um, and then we'll just do a quick wrap up. Uh, last question is, does product testing regulation and regenerative agriculture incentives um, belong in this bill in the panelists' opinions? Um, just really quick about that. I think that it should definitely be considered. I think that there's so many things to encompass in this whole thing. So first there kind of has to be like a compromise of it. It's not like a switch that's being turned on. It's kind of like a hill that's being climbed. There's so many different things to weave together. So, you know, I would love to see that regenerative practices, but I think before we even tackle that there's like other things to do um so with consideration of that but also just being able to keep it rolling and not having bottlenecking or stopping or delays or tangents because of different motivations i would just add that that would be um, foundational to keeping it in more in the ag sphere and not so much commercial sphere, uh, is setting that foundation for um, maybe refining and adding to and evolving the market down the road. So uh, that's why foundationally S54 won't get us there. It will, it's, like, it's like trying to twist something into shape as opposed to maybe starting fresh and with, with a properly designed infrastructure. I'd... I'd um... Yeah, just piggyback on that quickly, just last minute here, just to say, um, you know, yeah, uh, what Jeffrey just said, um, that, and that just comes full circle back to where we started, and that is, is that, you know, is, is you know, with all that's going into S fifty four, and um, what it, what it does, it doesn't get us there. Uh, it, it could. And it could, in relatively short order, if we had the political will and 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 somebody was to listen uh, to what it is that we're saying to them, uh, and we and it could work and it'd be a beautiful thing at the end of the day. But in its current state, because it's in conference committee, everything that's been done on this bill has been too little, and it is too late. So I think what we have to do now is is these ideas like rewriting, like writing that report, for example, on, for, on racial equity and incorporating these other pieces, there's plenty of time to do that and to have this thing right back in front of those folks in January. Uh, but the way it looks right now, it's just too little and it is too late uh, in conference committee. Yeah, and to be clear for folks who may not be as familiar with the conference committee process, essentially at this point, what the, um, this set of legislators is doing is comparing the two existing and you know already passed versions of the bill and kind of picking and choosing between what's already there. So there's not really um, a lot of meaningful opportunity to infuse you know new ideas, especially to the to to the degree that we think um, is necessary. So uh, we're at time. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much to all the panelists for taking the time and sharing um, all of your incredible knowledge with us. Um, the last thing that I want to do, um, if you are somebody who is on the call who is part of an organization or a business um, who wants to join our coalition in um, standing up against us before and, and committing to building better policy, 
I'm dropping a link to a sign-on letter uh, that we developed that we'll send to the conference committee members and the full legislature uh, that you can sign on to. And uh, we will send all of these links and information about how to get involved out in a follow-up email. Um, yeah, later on. So thanks everyone. Thank Have you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Great weekend. Thank you so much. Please join us.